Yeah, I'll see you all in hell too. You remember that. Every I'll see you in hell. September 29th, 2014, Caius Viovis, a 34-year-old Hells Angels member and self-proclaimed Satanist, was found guilty of kidnapping and dismembering three men in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. He received three consecutive life sentences, but his reaction shocked the entire court. Here are the 10 most dangerous Hells Angels reacting to life sentences. Number 10. Zane Peora Wallace in 2019, Zane, a Hells Angels prospect, was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum non-parole period of 15 and a half years for the murder of his ex-lover Wilson, a 30-year-old mother of two. According to multiple eyewitness reports, he had repeatedly beaten her in the months leading up to her death. However, a common question that came up in the case was, how did she not know that she was getting into a relationship with the devil? Well, the two had a brief relationship when they were teenagers, but it didn't last long. They eventually went their separate ways, but about nine months before her death, they decided to continue with that relationship. Except Wallace was not the same man she once knew. Wilson was often seen with injuries, and people even testified that they had seen her getting beaten up by Wallace at a Hells Angels club. Wallace was known to threaten her in the most vile ways you can imagine. Many times, he was heard telling her that he'd slit her throat and splatter her brains on the pavement. July 31st, 2019, the empty threats became a reality, when Wallace beat her up so badly that she had several teeth missing, scars, and broken ribs. Wilson's lifeless body was eventually discovered by Stephen Wallace Zane, Wallace's father, after he received a call from his son asking for help. He then called his daughter and wife, and together they dumped her at the emergency ward of the hospital with no help at all. She was later found by the medical team, but her case had become so critical that the hospital couldn't treat her. At that point, they were forced to transfer her to another hospital, but all their efforts were futile. August 2nd, 2019, Wilson died at Wellington Hospital. In turn, Wallace was arrested and his trial began two years later. However, because of some issues relating to medical evidence, his trial was postponed to 20 22. Though before it was postponed, Wallace pleaded not guilty to the murder charge against him, but eventually entered a guilty plea back in June 2022. On the day he was sentenced, more security had to be on the ground in the courtroom to make sure law and order would be upheld. And as soon as Wallace entered the courtroom, things became tense. After the judge sentenced him to life imprisonment with a minimum non-parole period of 15 years, he looked so defeated that his eyes mirrored resignation. His mother and sister would also get sentenced for attempting to pervert the course of justice concerning Wilson's death. Number 9. Jay Witt July 2013, accused of second-degree murder and using a firearm to commit a felony, Jay Witt faced a trial in connection with the death of William Furlong, who was found dead at a Hells Angels motorcycle clubhouse. The detailed surveillance video put Witt at the scene of the crime when the murder happened, and according to a detective who testified, the video outside the clubhouse showed him and his girlfriend entering around 2.15 a.m. Furlong shows up just before 5 a.m., then suddenly it shows Witt and his girlfriend leaving with a plastic bag. He would wipe down door handles and doors before driving away in a Chevy Cruze. During an interview with authorities, Witt's girlfriend Kozak told a police sergeant that all she knew was that Witt woke her up, claiming to have fought with someone and she would find a body downstairs. Witt was caught two weeks after an arrest warrant was issued, and during court proceedings, prosecutors argued that Witt and Furlong had been fighting before the murder. The prosecutor, Matt Cuss, requested the max sentence for manslaughter, emphasizing the fact that it would be easy to call Call the case a homicide case involving persons of Hells Angels Motorcycle Club, but that just downgrades the humanity of Mr. Furlong. Things would take a wild turn when Sergeant Jenkins at Omaha Police Department testified that Furlong's lifeless body was found between a couch and a bar at the clubhouse. An unnamed woman who was also present on the night of the murder claimed Witt killed Furlong after an argument and forced her to help remove the evidence from the scene. July 14th, 2013, at the sentencing, Cuss revealed that Witt tried to make it looked like it was a break-in by a rival club. This is all speculation, and the only person who could provide further information on the case remains to be Wit. 
However, he refused to cooperate with authorities. He eventually pleaded no contest to all three charges related to the killing of William Furlong and was to serve a mandatory 22 and a half years in prison, having been found guilty of charges that included manslaughter, use of a deadly weapon, and possession of a deadly weapon. As his sentence was read out, his face was void of any emotion. Subsequently, he wouldn't live long enough to see the outside of the prison walls. He died on the 25th of September, 2019. The exact cause is yet to be known, but officials stated that he was being treated for medical conditions. Number 8. Caius Viovis Yeah, I'll see you all in hell too, you remember that. Every September 2011, Caius was charged with first-degree kidnapping, witness intimidation, and murder of David Glasser, Edward Frampton, and Robert Shadwell. But this wouldn't be the first time he was in trouble with the law. Originally from Augusta, Maine, Caius was born Roy Gutfinski Jr., but legally changed his name and body in 2008 to fit his new persona. Inspired by a Twilight character and Roman god Viovis, who was thought to have escaped from hell, Caius looked fit for the role. He was drawn to the darker side of existence, finding refuge within the Hell's Angels. He previously had a stint with the law that proved he had some sort of psycho tendency, to say the least. In 1999, Caius and his then-girlfriend Deanne Jones shocked headlines when they kidnapped a girl and brutally slashed her body with a razor and began performing satanic rituals. They were found guilty in 2000, serving only three years of a 10-year sentence for elevated, aggravated assault and reckless conduct. And just to show you how disturbing this man truly was, all of this was before he even became a member of the Hells Angels. Prosecutors alleged that Caius had helped 37-year-old Hall and 47-year-old Chalou to kidnap and murder the three men. His trial was moved to Hampton Superior Court because he feared that the extensive publicity of the case in Berkshire County would prevent a fair jury selection. However, he insisted on his innocence throughout the case. Just one month before this trial began, DA Capos called my attorney, Gavin Reardon, and told him he knew I would not kill these men. Caius was found guilty of kidnapping, murdering, and dismembering the three victims. He was also convicted of three counts of kidnapping and three counts of witness intimidation in the killings of the three men. He didn't see it coming and started shouting in the courtroom. Caius Viovis has since tried to appeal. However, his case has been rejected. Number 7. Adam Lee Hall as the guilty verdicts were read, Adam Lee Hall's moment of freedom was over. His handcuffs were slapped back on. July 2009, in the city of Massachusetts, Adam Lee Hall assaulted Glasser with a baseball bat because he believed he had stolen from him. Glasser then reported to the police, and Hall was arrested and charged with assault and battery using a dangerous weapon. A year later, while the case was still pending, Hall tried to discredit Glasser as a witness by framing him for kidnap and possession of firearms. But the police were able to see through those shenanigans, and this earned Hall more charges. However, he was still free to move around. That's when he got into contact with Chalu and Viovis, also a Hells Angels prospect. August 27, 2011 was the last time the victims were seen, before their mutilated bodies were discovered 13 days later. And if the court file is anything to go by, David Glasser, Edward Frampton, and Robert Chadwell were murdered, most disturbingly, and then taken in Hall's Buick to a remote location, dispersed, and buried in a ditch. As the trial began, witnesses would take the stand, starting with an ex-girlfriend of Hall. She testified that he had three firearms concealed in a bag of dog food on the night of the 2011 murder. And if that wasn't enough, Rose Dawson testified that Hall visited her in the morning and asked her to buy bleach to clean his car, along with another witness, Alexandra Ellie, where she pointed out a brown liquid that came out of the trunk of the car. Dawson also spoke of an evening at the Hells Angels clubhouse, where Hall and others were mocking the victims. As much as Hall tried to maintain a calm demeanor, the trial was not void of some drama during the proceedings. Over there at the house, on Sunday afternoon, to meet with you. 20 miles away, at a barbecue. He was found guilty of three counts of murder, four counts of kidnapping, four counts of witness intimidation, assault, battery with a dangerous weapon, and conspiracy. However, he was found not guilty of two counts of witness intimidation, extortion, and kidnapping. As the jury's verdict was being read out, all appeared devastated, and you can hear the tears in the background. You say that the defendant is guilty of murder in the first degree. So say you've had a poor lady? Yes. So say you all of these gentlemen. 
for the charges he was found guilty of. Adam Lee Hall was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences with no possibility of parole. This case drew so much attention from the media that they ended up relocating the trial from Berkshire to Springfield. Number 6. Richard Devries They're shooting. They're shooting. Newly released cell phone footage shows part of the confrontation between Hells Angels bikers and rival Vagos Motorcycle Club last month on the Henderson Highway. October 2020, Richard Devries was arrested along with seven others on racketeering charges linked to a shooting that happened in May on Henderson Highway. Charges on top of the racketeering include conspiracy to commit murder, attempted murder, battery, and discharging a firearm at or into an occupied structure. According to the prosecutors, on May 29th, Devries, along with other members of Hells Angels, opened fire on six Vagos motorcyclists on the U.S. highway. A witness told the police dispatchers that she had seen the Angels stopped at an emergency exit just moments earlier, and they appeared to be waiting for the gang to drive by. Some members of the Hells Angels from the shooting were later seen on security footage at a Henderson Harley Davidson location, parking their bikes in a secret garage. Prosecutors believe that the attack may have been in retaliation for a San Bernardino shooting that resulted in the death of a Hells Angels member. About a month ago in San Bernardino, a Vagos did, did kill a Hell, Hells Angels. And although a Vagos member disputed this claim, it remains a very strong debate. The police also discovered many bullet casings that had been fired from over a mile along the highway. However, it was uncertain if it was a full-on gun battle involving the Vagos group, or if all those reported injured had sustained gunshot injuries. Devries was initially arrested along with Aaron Chun, Cameron Trike, and Russell Smith, who prosecutors have identified as prospects. According to the prosecutors, the Las Vegas Hells Angels chapter had been operating as a criminal syndicate for over three years, and Devries was directly involved in financing the organization. As the proceedings were going on, the judge ordered Devries to be taken into custody, setting his bail at 250000 And like most other members of Hells Angels, Devries showed no emotion, and even looked quite cooperative. We haven't heard news of him posting bail, which means he's still being held by the authorities. Number 5. Frank Annabuth between 2009 and 2013, Frank Hannibuth, a German biker and notorious leader of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club in Europe, led an army of over 50 bikers in what could simply be described as insanely illegal activities. Now, Some of these activities include racketeering, money laundering, drug trafficking, and gun trafficking, among other things. He was arrested alongside 46 other members of their club, and they were accused of orchestrating a web of organized crime including extortion, pimping, and a illegal firearms, plus daring robberies on the Spanish island of Mallorca and Ibiza. The charges against Hannibuth carry a 13-year sentence and a $4.5 million fine for criminal group membership, money laundering, and illegal firearm possession. Other members are facing up to 38 years in prison for their involvement in assorted prostitution rings and drug trafficking. Out of all the angels we've talked about up to this point, the story of Frank Hannibuth was a major blow to the sinister activities of this club and is an eye-opener to the activities of this supposedly ordinary motorbike club. Before the trial was completed, Annabeth exercised his right to make a final statement, and if you've been following us so far, then you might have a clue about what he said. Like any other Hells Angels member, he declared that the Angels are not a criminal organization, emphasizing that each member has equal membership. He denied the existence of a president at any level at all, and while many defendants opt for plea deals and fines, Annabeth refused any form of a plea deal. He kept a stern face throughout the trial, and even when the judge sentenced him to 13 years, he looked unfazed. Number 4. David Chalou David Chalou has been on trial since late April in connection with the kidnapping and killings of David Glasser, Edward Frampton, and Robert Chadwell. August 2011. The disfigured remains of the three Pittsfield men were discovered in Beckett by law enforcement agencies, which have revealed that the victims were abducted, shot, and then dismembered. These heinous acts were all linked to three men. Adam Lee Hall, Caius Viovis, 
and David Chalou. Now, Chalou was trialed as the second defendant in the 2011 triple homicide case that drew national attention due to the disturbing nature of the murders. Although he denied those charges and other related offenses, David Cassie, a key eyewitness, described in detail how Chalou and his accomplices, Paul and Viovis, butchered the three men, cutting their bodies off into pieces. At first, there wasn't any evidence linking Chalou to the murders. However, the prosecutors at the trial decided to use the test testimonies of jailhouse informants as evidence against Chalou. One of these guys, known as Christopher Latalian, stated that while Chalou had been at the Berkshire County House of Correction in September 2011, Chalou had told him, I got a body. Not only do I got one body, I got three bodies. Not only do I got three bodies, but I made him disappear. Not only did I make him disappear, but 14 days later, they found him cut into pieces at the bottom of a ditch. As crazy as that sounds, that wasn't the only witness statement. This next one is simply horrifying. Now, just before his trial, Chalou was moved to Sousa Baranowski Correctional Center, where he met a member of the Aryan Brotherhood, Jethro Kempton. Now, Kempton testified that the defendant had described his role in the murder of the three victims. According to Kempton, Chalou knocked on the door of the targeted victim, and when they had gotten in to get him, they discovered he had two friends over that night. Kempton also added that Chalou didn't feel remorseful about anything he saw said that night. He said Chalou jokingly mentioned that while they were shooting the guys, one of them ran off into the woods naked. He also mentioned that the defendant let the bodies of the victims sit for a while to avoid making a mess when they dismembered them. After the jury listened to the testimonies presented to the court, they deliberated and came back with a guilty verdict. But when all 12 jurors were individually polled, one person said she had not come to that decision. So Hampton Superior Court judge rendered that verdict void, as he wanted a unanimous verdict. By the time the jury reconvened, they had reached a unanimous vote, finding Chalou guilty of all charges against him. Describing the defendant's conduct as heinous would be an understatement. The victims had been subjected to death in a depraved manner, and it certainly gladdened most people who followed the case when the judge said he wouldn't hesitate to impose the harshest possible sentence in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. David Chalou was given three consecutive life sentences without parole for all three murders. As the jury's verdict was being read. Chalou appeared to be unfazed by the decision. It was almost as if he had succumbed to fate. Number 3. Joseph Lancia The head of the Rhode Island chapter of the Hells Angels, Joseph Lancia, led into Superior Court in handcuffs. The biker leader was arrested Saturday night after a fight at the Cadillac Lounge Strip Club. June 2019, the leader of Hells Angels Club in Rhode Island, Joseph Lancia, was arrested after an investigation into reports of shots fired and faced charges relating to attempting to kill a former club prospect. Now that morning, the victim was driving a Max semi truck past the clubhouse located on Wendell Street when the defendant, Lancia, took out a 25 cal semi-automatic and fired a single shot at the truck. Luckily for the victim, he was able to escape. He turned into the next street and alerted the Rhode Island police. And in just a few seconds, the tactical team had swarmed the area, executing a search warrant at the Messer Street Clubhouse, where Lancio was. And your warning sign, 161 Messer Street. This is the state police. Come out with your hands up. Do it now. During the search, the team found three handguns and different types of ammunition. Additionally, they found the 25 cal bullet fired by Lancia into the truck's passenger side door. He was arrested but was granted bail, and after his release, he decided to lay low for a while. But less than a year later, disaster struck again. February 2020, the Hells Angels club leader was in the news again, this time for an altercation at the clubhouse. An officer working detail at the club had witnessed Lancia punch a bouncer. And although the bouncer didn't want to press charges, the police had already witnessed it. This meant Lancia had violated the terms of his 2019 bail, and he was charged with disorderly conduct. His lawyer kept trying to make a case for him. However, the court wasn't convinced by the result, so he was held without bail. That wasn't to be the last we heard of Lancia, though. In 2022, he requested that the judge, who was now presiding over the case, Judge Kristen E. Rogers, recuse herself from the case because her husband was a lieutenant in the Rhode Island 
Island Police Department. He argued that Rogers' marriage to Little Compton Police Chief Scott Rains made it improper for her to judge his case. However, the record showed that his request stemmed from a raid that Judge Rogers' husband wasn't involved in. As you might have guessed, she didn't recuse herself because of a lack of evidence. But Lancia did something surprising before his ruling was finalized. He pleaded no contest to the charges, and in the plea deal he received a 15-year sentence at the Adult Correctional Institute, five years to be served, and 10 years probation. He was also given three years in prison for the assault charge with one year to be served concurrently with the previous sentence. Additionally, the judge imposed a no-contact order between Lancia and the victim Richard, securing his protection for eight years. The judge also made him pay $3,650 in restitution during the sentencing. Lancia declined to address the court and kept a very straight face, almost void of any emotion. Is there anything that you would like to say, sir? Nothing. Number two, Jeremy Christian. We don't want you here. May 26th, 2017, a day Portland natives won't forget in a hurry. Three people were brutally stabbed on a Max train by Jeremy Christian after he was confronted for shouting racist and anti-Muslim slurs at two black girls. Two of the victims, Rick John and Talisa Murden, lost their lives, while the third, Micah Fletcher, survived with serious wounds. Christian was arrested and indicted soon after the attack on charges of murder and attempted murder, among other crimes. According to eyewitness reports, it all started around 4.30 p.m. Christian began assaulting the girls, racially claiming he was a taxpayer and that colored people were ruining the city. We got it! Supreme Court rulings for our freedom of speech since the 50s and 60s in the Northwest. As the man continued ranting, the train operator was heard on the loudspeaker saying, Whoever's creating the disturbance needs to exit the train immediately. This didn't deter Jeremy, though. In fact, it only seemed to infuriate him more. He started directing his tirade at a Muslim Somali girl who was wearing a hijab and her non-Muslim friend, a black girl. Out of fear, they moved to the back of the train, and that was when the victim stepped in to try and form a barrier between Christian and the girls. After a little back and forth, Christian threatened to kill whoever touched him, and within the twinkle of an eye, he'd mercilessly stabbed the victims. Then commotion erupted on the train with everyone running in every direction. Some people stayed back to administer first aid to the victims, and others would chase after Christian while calling 911. He was arrested shortly after that stabbing, and true to his character, he didn't show any sign of remorse. The patrol car footage showed Christian saying, after his arrest. I just stabbed a bunch of motherfuckers in the neck. I can die in prison as a happy man. June 6, 2017, the Multnomah County Grand Jury indicted Christian on 15 counts. Of these, 11 related to the May 26 stabbings, two counts of aggravated murder, one count of attempted aggravated murder, one count of first-degree assault, and two counts of menacing, and four related to the conduct the day before the stabbing, when Christian threw a plastic bottle at a black woman at the Max train station. But that wasn't all. Another outburst occurred at a court appearance on the 7th of June, and simply there was no stopping this dude. Christian pleaded not guilty to all the charges, but his demeanor at the proceeding showed he was indeed an unstable person, screaming and shouting at witnesses before he had to be removed from the courtroom for racially abusing a witness. And number one, Rod Sweeney. A member of the Hells Angels appeared in court today to face assault charges stemming from an incident involving a leukemia patient. Summer 2016, Rod Sweeney, a 48-year-old full-fledged member of the notorious biker gang Hells Angels in the UK, received a sentence for an unprovoked attack on a boy and his uncle. And when we say unprovoked, we mean it. It all happened on the 5th of August, 2013. An uncle was teaching his nephew, who had been struggling with cancer, how to ride a bike in the back lane between Batters Hill Street and Moncton Avenue in East Kildenan, near Sweeney's home. All of a sudden, they would hear a voice coming from Sweeney's property asking him what they were doing and telling him they were being watched on a security camera. Not thinking too much about it, especially since they weren't doing anything wrong, they continued about their normal business until shortly afterward, Sweeney would drive up in an SUV and attack with a metal baton, breaking the boy's arm 
and punching his uncle repeatedly. Sweeney, at the time with 10 prior criminal convictions, half of which were for assault, had no reason to attack him. The victims didn't know him. They did nothing to provoke this. All they really did was ride a bike on the street. The defendant tried to make a case for Sweeney, saying that Mr. Sweeney dealt with severe paranoia and was scared that he might get robbed. But the court of the Queen's bench, Sandra Sanook, said that he took the time to grab a metal baton, get in a vehicle with a friend, and drive up to the young men in the back lane. He had time to stop and change his mind, but he did it. In October 2016, the judge found Sweeney guilty of aggravated assault and assault with a weapon after a trial at which Sweeney's defense argued he'd been away on a fishing trip at the time of the assault. The victims were unarmed and a lot smaller in stature than Mr. Sweeney, but for some reason, the innocent activity of bike riding aggravated him. The victims didn't file their victim impact statement in court, and the uncle has since moved out of the neighborhood because, according to them, they don't want anything to do with him. When the judge read out his sentence, he had a look of regret and resignation. It looked like he had accepted his fate.